And I work in recovery. I try to work with the other actors. Tough call. It's a narcissistic illness. Look at me, look at me, look at me. <laughs> That's what it's all about. So I moved out of the city and moved up with my kids, my grandkids and my children. I have a 30-acre ranch with Running Creek in the mountains of Southern, uh, Central California. And um, it's very beautiful, very remote, and uh, lots of recovery there. And I go to meetings every day. I'm in a 12-step program. And that has become my life, working with other women. Off the street, out of jail, trying to find our way home. It's been wonderful. It's giving me life that I never dreamed of. To be of service, to help another person find a higher power and get clean and sober is the greatest gift any woman could have. So I'm very grateful, and I have Star Trek fans that are just so supportive. I mean, you guys are so supportive. And I wrote this book, of course you all know, I wrote this book, The Longest Trek, about my journey, the first 15 years of my sobriety, and talked about all of the places I've been. My first film, Some Like It Hot, with Marilyn Monroe, Tony Curtis, and Jack Lemmon. What a wonderful thing I got. I got an audition and there I went for that. It came out from New York. Or anybody here from New York? I started in New York with uh, Phil Silver's Top Banana a long time ago and then went into Three Penny Opera. I did Lucy Brown. That was a gutsy part. Lucy Brown in Three Penny Opera. And traveled with that. This was in the 50s, 60s. Before, way before Star Trek. I did about 80 shows before Star Trek with uh, under contract at Warner's with all of the Angie Dickinson and uh, Chad Everett and Troy Donahue <laughs> and uh, my wonderful friend uh, Kooky Burns. You remember all those Surfside Six and, and, and all those great, great uh, shows. And I worked with Ann Margaret and worked with her hubby. He was in, uh, in uh, Surfside 6 with, um, and 77 Sunset Strip. All of those shows, that's where I, I, I came into the biz. I came into the biz in that era where actors worked every darn week. Almost twice a week. We did films twice a week. Three days here, three days there. It was just fabulous. So I got a great education. And after Some Like It Hot, I did Irma LaDuce with Shirley MacLaine. Irma LaDuce was written for Marilyn Monroe. She overdosed before she could do the film. That was my first taste of overdose. And of course, there's a lot, a lot of it still. But she was such a mega star. She was, she was unbelievable. There are no words to even explain how good she was and how beautiful and wild she was. No wonder people just loved her. Anyway, Arthur Miller was with her and he practically carried, he practically packed a 38 around her walking down, I remember we did it in Del Coronado. He protected her. Even from the actors he protected her. And then all of a sudden she was gone. So that was the beginning of a long journey for me because I had the same addiction Marilyn did. I'm an alcoholic. And I didn't know it because everybody else drank. Why can't I? Well, I couldn't stop once I got started. I just saw Richard Hatch out in the, in the, uh, in the foyer, good friend. He said, I want some of your energy. Look at all this energy you've got. I said, that's why I drank, to come down. I was so energetic as a kid, they didn't know what to do with me. Today, I think they give me Ritalin, don't they? <laughs> I was before Ritalin. <laughs> so I used alcohol, but isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? That I was so high-strung, I was born that way. 
And, and Richard said, why? And I said, well, I'm very talented. You know, talented people are very high strung. <laughs> Just giving myself a plug, it's okay. <laughs> anyway, I did all that stuff and did all those films and did um, worked with Sharon Tate in, in Warner Brothers and then she was removed. Sharon Tate was, you know, part of that era. I got a real good education in Hollywood. And so it's, a lot of it's in the book. And um, I, I just I have a website, gracelywhitney.net. You can order the book. I sold out, and I don't have any with me. So if you come to the table, I have photos, but I don't have any books. But the book goes way right back through. Leonard Nimoy did the uh, forward. And he said it's one of the best Star Trek books ever written because it was so honest. I told a lot of stuff about my life that most people don't hear unless you go into recovery. If you go into recovery, you hear it every day. But most people don't realize, you know, what you have to go through to get clean and sober. Anybody clean and sober in here? Good. Woo! One. How many? Two, three, four, one. See, she's the miracle. She's a total miracle. She's clean and sober. So I'm happy. No, you don't have to clap. No, you don't have to clap. I should clap for you. Anyway, that's what happened. And um, under contract at Warner's, bottoming out, bottoming out, bottoming out, bottoming out. Finally got sober, 1950. And I have done, of course, all of Star Trek. Got written out of Star Trek because of my alcohol, I'm sure. Uh, I had a sexual assault on the lot. And uh, when we were at Desi Lu, I was taking lessons from Lucille Ball, who, you know, produced Star Trek. Lucille Ball was the only one who liked Star Trek. Everybody else thought we were weird. And she produced us, and I was a singer with Desi, Desi Lu, with Desi's band in Palm Springs. I would go down there and do gigs with him. He had a great band, and I was his singer. I'm taking lessons from Lucy. And then, of course, I did Outer Limits. This was one of the last of the 80 shows I did. Outer Limits, uh, Bob Justman was uh, the producer on the show, and he was Gene Roddenberry's assistant. And I remember he told me, he said, we have found Yeoman Rand. He called Gene, and that's how I got Star Trek. So I did, uh, did those, all those shows and then got into Star Trek with the pilots. And then, of course, we sold Star Trek because of the color TV. You do know that. They needed something for color TV, so they picked up Star Trek. That was one of the reasons they did that. And Lucille Ball was right in the beginning. And we have writers on the first year of the show I consider it to be just phenomenal stuff. Just phenomenal. D.C. Fontana was there, and Harlan Ellison, who was just amazing. I did some shows with Harlan over at Warner Brothers. Uh, he was a good friend. We just had, we just had good people working track. And uh, we didn't know what we were doing. We were scared to death. Um, I, I didn't know how to do the character. This was a whole new thing. And, um, and Rand was told several different things. Rand was told that she was uh, just out of school, flight school. She came on board because she would, just wanted to work in space. And they put her with this captain. And she was supposed to be like Kitty with, uh, with uh, Matt Dillon. She used to take care of him, bring him his food. Do the computer? I had a little computer. Remember the, the tri tricorder? Yeah, the tricorder. I had that on, and I was to figure out what to do with him. That's a hard choice, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and of course Leonard. I was taking lessons with Leonard right on the set. Leonard was a teacher. Before that, he sold vacuum cleaners. Did you know that? He was a vacuum cleaner salesman in Beverly Hills before he became Spock. Don't you just love that? I love that. I tease him about it all the time. Anyway, so here I am, a rose between two thorns. This is the pre-production photo. I hadn't, didn't have the red uniform yet or the wig, that famous Wig. Did you see the girl walking around the convention yeah. with the wig on? Isn't that amazing? She said, I have to take this off. It's too heavy. I said, yes, I know. I, I relate. I relate. It was always slightly off plumb, you know. <laughs> when I do a shot, they'd come up and they go, and pull it back into shape, especially an enemy within. That was really tough. I was black and blue for weeks from, uh, from that film. 
And my kids did, Mary, my two boys, seven and nine, did uh, stole the communicators on Mary. And so we couldn't get back to the ship. And of course the two girls, you know this, at the end of Mary, they pick up, he picks up two girls, those are his, those are his daughters. And Jean Rottenberry's daughter was in it also. And um, let's see, what else can I tell you before I open it up for questions? Um, uh, let's see, where was I? What show were I at? Children. Children. Oh yeah, my kids. And then my older boy did Star Trek the Motion Picture. They, uh, everybody was clamoring to do that movie after, after everything was over and we did Star Trek the Motion Picture. First Star Trek the Motion Picture started out as a series. And they were going to do it as a series and then they said, no, we don't want to do that. It'll never be a success. We don't want to do it. And of course, Star Wars had just come out and everybody was jumping out of the windows, you know. They should have done Star Trek way before that, but they didn't. And of course, it's okay because Star Wars is so part of our, our convention and all of our work. And that worked. And then we did, um, when, we, when we did uh, uh, the motion picture, the casting director said, I want all of your children to come down and audition for extras, including um, uh, the, the wife of the, of the director. Robert Wise's wife was a huge Trek fan, and she wanted to be as an extra, so they put her in the rec scene. Remember the rec room scene? They put her in there, and they put my son in. They, they, told, they told my son, we're going to hire you because you look like Leonard Nimoy. And I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> Well, that's all right. So, he had a beautiful Afro haircut. This was 19... Does anybody know the date? It was the 79? 79. Thank you. Uh, he, he, had a, he was in college. He had a beautiful Afro. He was studying logic. He was going to be a uh, airline, a pilot. That's what he did. He was going to be a pilot. So, he came down to the studio and they said, you look a lot like Spock. So, they made him a Vulcan medic with Jimmy Doohan's two boys, Chris and his other boy. I have a picture of the four of, of the one, two, three, four, five of us together. Just magnificent with Jimmy and his two boys and me and Scott. And we're, and we're just, Scott, is that funny? I named him Scott long before the Enterprise. Anyway, uh, they cut his hair like Spock. They took the hair, his beautiful curls and cut them all off and plastered it down and put hair, the, the, the uh, sideburns on him. He had to go back to college for that haircut. <laughs> <laughs> he said he, he just never, he said they wouldn't let him. They thought he was kidding. He told them he had just been in the movie. They said, oh yeah, sure. I mean, he couldn't convince anybody of it. So anyway, he's a big fan today. A big fan. Now my other boy's a teacher, a jazz player, he's a musician a jazz player, and he lives up with me on my property. I gave the property to the boys. I deeded it to them, gift deeded. And so they could, so I could see it while I'm still alive. I'm 81 years old, by the way. Is that not good? Yeah. So I did all that, and then we did the internet. Of course, you all know the new voyages. We did that with uh, Tubac. Oh no, we did Enterprise for, no, no, not Enterprise, um, what? No, flashback with, um, Janeway, 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 oh, what a magnificent actor she is, she's, she's so good, she's almost as good as we are, <laughs> Janeway's up here. She said that the Enterprise was put together with spit and rubber bands. Couldn't we do better than that? Whoa, I almost punched her out. <laughs> it's kind of us that you're still here, honey. Don't get so... Don't just as hard and bent out of shape. You and me if it weren't for me. Ah, well, anyway. So, and then the other question I get, and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, the uniform, the uniform. They always say, weren't you embarrassed to wear that uniform? And I said, no, I'm the architect of the uniform. And they said, what? I said, yeah, in the beginning, 
I had a blue, a, a yellow top with black pants. All the way, pants, covering the best part of me. <laughs> so I went to Gene Roddenberry, I said, you're not going to let the best part of me go without some kind of representation. I said, let's do a Barbarella. <laughs> That's where it came from. The, the uniform with Bill Tice, of course, William Tice was a genius, designed our little Skort. It was a skort. Do you ladies know that? It had a panel over the front. Mm -hmm. We had tights on so that we were totally covered with our beautiful black stockings and boots. The only thing Gene didn't go for is I wanted a dagger in the boot. <laughs> but he said, no, we can't do that. <laughs> anyway, then the hair came and they put it down and then they kept getting higher and Gene says, higher, higher. So it kept going higher and higher. And that's how the uniform was created. And Barbara Bain, I was talking about it today with Richard. Barbara Bain and Mark Landau did Mission Impossible, right? Mm -hmm. When Nichelle and I, when Nichelle and I would walk down to the commissary every day in our uniforms, and Major too, walk down, Barbara Bain went crazy over our uniforms. And that's how she created um, Space 1999. She, she fell in love with Star Trek. That's how that whole thing got started. So there, there's a lot of trivia for you. I have only five minutes. Has anybody got something they want to scream at me? Five minutes? Anybody got a question? Yes, go ahead. More about flashback in your... Yes, flashback was phenomenal. We, uh, we did, first of all, they called us in after Star Trek VI. They called us in the office and they said, we're going to do a flashback, a... a uh, we're going to do a, uh, a pilot for a spin-off of the Excelsior. George and Gracie on the Excelsior. Does anybody get that? <laughs> it's also the whales. George and Gracie oh, were yeah, whales. Yeah. But George and Gracie were way back there. Is anybody old enough to know George and Gracie? Yeah, yeah. you are. Okay. So, they said we're going to do that and it's going to be a Tuvok story. We are going to explain how Tuvok got to where he is. So that's how they explained it to us. So we went in and did it. We never got a moment's peace. The fans, zines, the magazines, the, the photographers, the papers couldn't believe that George and I were in this show and that we were creating this tremendous idea for a flashback for a miniseries. It was going to be a miniseries. Every three months we were going to shoot one and bring in the cast from the whole, all of the shows, everything. It would have been magnificent. Well, they couldn't get enough, uh, they couldn't get enough uh, a generated fan thing. Plus, I think it was a money deal because the money had to go back to the original series rather than to the people that were producing the new show. So I think that's what caused Paramount to say, no way. So, they did USS Enterprise, which of course was wonderful. But anyway, they came in every lunch hour. We never got a chance to go to lunch. They were shooting pictures of us and doing all kinds of stuff. And uh, what other thing can I tell you? They had, two, they had a television camera right on the set with, flash, with um, the Excelsior Star Trek VI playing. And they had tried to get everybody to look just like that for flashback. And uh, Jane Wayne, that's where I met Jane Wayne, we, we kibitzed a lot. That's where I told off Tuvok, which I love to do. And that's where they took my uniform off. I didn't know what I was going to do then. <laughs> anyway, that's the story of Flashback. Anything else you want to know about it? That was amazing. At the end of it, what she told me, when she put, just put down the original series because we were spitting rubber bands, at the very end of it, when we were leaving, we did our last shot, and the whole crew and all the actors from, uh, from, uh, from Jane Way's crew and everybody stood up and George and I were standing there and they just gave us a standing ovation. It was just fabulous. And then of course we went on to do the new voyages on the internet, which I just love doing too, and Tuvok was directing. And then of course that was a wonderful one for, for Walter and for all of us. So. Um, Anybody else?
with a question. Oh, okay, go ahead. How many times did Shatner hit on me? Well, I'm going to tell you a true story. We were in New York uh, the beginning of this year doing, um, uh, what were we doing? 45 year reunion of, of Star Trek. It was our first convention for the year of 45 years. I was setting up next to Richard Arnold in the dealer's room. Had me setting up, Richard was here. The, the fans were coming in from down there, there were double doors and fans were coming in. And as I'm all set up and I'm looking down and all of a sudden I see this man with a baseball hat. I said, my God, that looks like Bill Shatner. Well, it was. He was shooting a documentary. He was down at the end of the hall and he was coming down with the camera crew. And as he was getting closer and everything, I went, hi, Bill. And he came over to the table and came up to me and said, we never made it, did we? <laughs> I said, my mistake. <laughs> so that's how we remember things. 45 years ago. Can you imagine? A man never changes, do they? You guys never change. <laughs> anyway, am I through? Am I washed up? All through. God bless you all. I love you. Ladies and gentlemen, from our track, the original. Everything else, the lovely, fantastic, great.